Welcome back to Medical Engineering. So today we want to talk a little bit about a new kind of modality. This is called X-ray face contrast imaging. So in the following video we want to talk a bit about whether X-rays are really particles or waves and we'll see that there's also wave characteristics that we can use in order to determine face contrast and related contrasts. So, looking forward to exploring a little bit more of X-ray physics with you guys. So face contrast imaging and we start with a little motivation. So let's have a look at what we can actually find with the face contrast images. So this is the absorption image. So you've already seen that for quite some time and we know that this is essentially just the absorption effect, just the regular X-ray image as we know it. You see that we see bones here very well and this is actually a mouse that you can see here in this image. But there's more to that. There is the so-called differential phase and this is measuring the phase shift and here we get very different contrasts and to be honest we actually get a derivative with respect to x direction that is reconstructed and you see that we see the very fine structures here in the lung. Yet we have a third modality here and the third modality is the so-called dark field image. In the dark field image this is a very different contrast than what we had in mind so far because this is reacting to structures. So you can see here that it reacts to the lung and it reacts here to, you could say the skin of the mouse, but it's actually not the skin, it's the fur. So it's the tiny hair that is growing on the mouse and this causes a large signal that we can see here in this image. So, to be honest, the dark field image is measuring micro angle scatter. So, we can see scatter that is actually caused by microstructures that lies in the range of micrometers. So, here are the hairs and also the very small and fine structures, the small bubbles in the lung that cause this high contrast in this image. So, you see, this is a completely new contrast and we think that it may become highly relevant with respect to medical diagnosis. So we actually have a kind of overview image here where we show again the three different contrasts for a different kind of object. Here this is a mastectomy. So we actually removed the breast in the case of a cancer and then we looked at the breast with the different modalities and here you can see first of all there is some things appearing in the face contrast image but more importantly you see these small shadows that don't show up in any of the other two images and we think that this is related to microcalcifications which are indicative of early cancer development. So here face contrast and dark field images may be game changers for the diagnosis of breast cancer. So what do we see in these images? Let's summarize this. In the absorption image we see differences in radiation absorption. In the phase contrast image we see the differences in phase shifts and in the dark field we see the ultra small angle scattering that is actually caused by microscopic structures that are actually way smaller than the actual detector pixel or the reconstruction voxel grid. So we can measure effects that are an order of magnitude smaller than the actual reconstruction takes place on. So this is pretty interesting and we'll see some very interesting results towards the end of this video.
Now let's discuss a little bit why we can use the wave characteristics in order to get contrast. And the key element that we want to look at here is interference. We can get interference between two waves if we add them. And here is an example with two different wavelengths. And you can see that at some places it actually causes a constructive interference and at other places they cancel out and there is a loss of signal. Unfortunately, this is not stationary and it moves along with the waves, so we don't have a stable interference here. If you want to achieve stable interference, you need waves of the same wavelength. So they have the same wavelength and they will amplify exactly in the cases where they are in synchrony. So here you get stronger signals because the wavelengths are exactly in phase. And in order to get cancellation, you actually have to have the signal in a position where the wavelength is shifted by half a wavelength. And if that happens, then you will get a cancellation. So you see that the positive and the negative parts here, they always oppose each other. And this causes a cancellation here when the two waves are superimposed. So we learned that for stationary interference, we need at least two waves and they have to be at the same frequency. And then we have a constant phase shift. If we have a constant phase shift, we get exactly this cancellation and also constructive interference patterns that we then can observe as white and black peaks. So if we want to construct this, we have to use a geometric setup that is called Young's double slit experiment. Already in 1801, Thomas Young discovered this kind of experiment with two slits and visible light. And what he demonstrated is essentially that you can construct interference patterns. And these interference patterns, if you use two slits, they form white and black fringes here. And they're approximately in the same distance. In order to do that, you need one light source that is emitting essentially a wavefront here. And by the double slit, essentially the wavefront copies. And this causes then the interference pattern. So Young showed this with visible light, but we can construct similar stuff also with x-rays. And we'll see that it's a bit more complicated to construct it, but technically we can also use this effect to get a signal. Now, what is actually relevant is the distance that is the difference in the actual phase. So we are actually interested in a delta, and this delta then constructs the positive and negative interference patterns, the black and white fringes. And in order to determine this, you have to know the distance between the two slits and this angle here, because this angle here is driving the delta D. And from the angle here and the distance, I can compute the delta D. And if I have a delta D that is exactly one wavelength or zero, then I will have the constructive interference. And if I have half a wavelength, the two waves will cancel out. So that's the key observation that we need to keep in mind. So let's summarize this. The light from the two slits form a visible pattern on the screen. The pattern consists of a series of bright and dark parallel bands called fringes. And the constructive interference patterns occurs when a bright fringe is there, the destructive interference pattern is a dark fringe. Now, how is this constructed? And we can visualize this here. So if we have exactly the same distance in terms of the wave propagating from here to here and from here to here, then they will be in sync. So if I have a wave running around here, then you will see that I get exactly the same kind of observation here and the two waves will actually start to interfere in a constructive manner. If I have 
half a wavelength in between, then I can also create an interference pattern. And here you actually see that in this particular kind of setup, we have a different length here and a different length here. And this then means that also our waves, they have to travel over different distances. And here you see exactly that this kind of interference appears. And now that I've drawn it, it's actually not a bright area. So this is a dark area that appears here because the way I've drawn it. Obviously, this would be half a wavelength of shift. And there can be also the other case where you have then exactly one additional wavelength of shift. And if I choose my wavelength again in the same way, then you will see that I get exactly one more wave up there, but they still intersect at a point where they have essentially exactly the same phase shift. And then we have a bright fringe appearing here. So this is how the constructive and the destructive patterns emerge. And we can actually summarize this. If we formalize over delta d, delta, and our angle, and the two distances r1 and r2, then we can actually set this up into an equation. So delta d is given as d times sine of theta. And if the case is d times sine of theta is m times lambda, so m is an integer value here. If this is exactly an integer, you will have the bright fringe. And if the pattern is shifted by half a wavelength, and again, m is an integer, you get the dark fringe. So this is the main result that explains us how we are actually constructing this kind of positive and negative interference patterns and how the bright and dark fringes emerge. Very well. There's a little more to that because these interference patterns, they don't appear at arbitrary distances. They actually appear in certain distances, which is called the Talbot effect. This is the Talbot distance. And the Talbot distance tells us essentially that if I'm exactly in a Talbot distance of one, I observe the interference pattern. But at the Talbot distance, times two, there's exactly nothing, just gray, no interference pattern. And at a typo distance of three, we get the interference pattern again. At four, we don't get it. And at five, we get it again. So you see that it's not just the slit and how far the slits are apart. But if I step to a grating that has many of those slits, then we get this kind of Talbot effect and we get these Talbot distances and only at odd Talbot distances, I will be able to observe the fringe patterns here. So this is really crucial if you want to construct a kind of interference pattern. Well, the next thing is that we can construct a so-called grating-based interferometer from this. Now, of course, there's also other ways how to construct an interferometer. So this is the guide that we want to look at. And the main reason why we want to look at it is because we can use simply a medical grade X-ray source and we can construct it with very, very similar means as we already encountered in the previous videos. For the others, we typically need better X-ray sources. So for crystal interferometer, propagation-based imaging, or analyzer-based imaging, you need better X-ray sources. And therefore, we can't use them typically in a lab setup. So this one, you can also find the references in the textbook. We won't use a lot of time to look into them. Actually, we just want to name them here on the slide. And now we continue talking about the grating-based imaging. 
So first of all, we need a grating and the grating has to be produced at very fine structures. You see here that we have gold and silicon layers and the distance between two subsequent layers is actually two micrometer. So that's a very fine structured grating. And this grating can then actually be used to create these interference patterns. Now, a key problem with this is this is typically constructed using a silicon waiver. And a problem that we typically have is that the silicon waiver has a diameter of approximately 15 centimeters. And with the 15 centimeters, we essentially have a circle. So if we want to have a grating that is broad, then we essentially can only have certain sizes. And if we want to have very long gratings, then they cannot be very broad. So this is limitation that is caused by the manufacturing process. If you can manufacture them, you can then go ahead and build a grating based interferometer. So this is what you would like to do. You would like to have a point source that creates this uniform wavefront. And then you need a phase grating, the G1. And this constructs then our interference pattern. Then you go into the right type of distance. You use an ideal detector. And there you go. You get the fringe pattern. Sounds cool. Now what would happen if we actually place an object here? So we place an object. We have the grating here and then the detector here, what we would observe is a change in the fringe pattern. So the object causes the fringes to shift and also to change the magnitude. So you can see that here there's also a change in the magnitude of the fringes and they shift. And we can use this effect in order to measure the information that we would like to have. So in this case, we would now have the signal without sample and with sample. And this allows us to determine the absorption because that's the difference in terms of magnitude of the two signals. And then there is the shift of the fringes that gives us the differential phase. So this is exactly what you would like to have. Sounds great. So let's just build it. And then you build the system. And the first thing you realize is you put your detector pixel here and all you measure is gray because our pixels, they're this huge. This is one pixel. Now our interference pattern actually has this frequency here. So all is averaged out to this gray kind of color here and we can't measure it because our detectors are way too big to measure it. So are we doomed? Well, let's think about this again. Maybe we can use a trick. So the problem here is that the fringe has a width of a few microns. So we can't see it on the detector pixel because the detector pixel is maybe 50 microns or 150 microns. So it's way bigger than the actual fringe pattern. And this is why we introduce the analyzer grating G2. G2 has exactly the period as we would expect in the fringe pattern. So the fringe size is determined by the design energy and G2 is constructed exactly in the way that it has the period of our expected fringe pattern. And if we have that, then we are suddenly able to measure absorption, phase and dark field. So that's cool. The measurement procedure is called phase stepping. And why is it called phase stepping? Well, because we have to step. Now we have a measurement, our point source, wavefront, here we have our fringes and here we have the right type of distance and here is our detector pixel. But now we put in the analyzer grating. You see the analyzer grating here? And this analyzer grating is now positioned in a way that it's exactly facing the white fringes. So all of the white fringes are blocked at present and we can't see them. And as a result, everything on our pixel is black. So our observed value over the entire pixel is zero. Note that we have some arbitrary units here, but let's just say it's zero. So this is the result of the measurement. And now we shift our pattern slightly. And if we shift it slightly, we start getting some signal because we gradually move from the white fringe to the black fringe. And we get some signal 
we just did a small step, but we can reconstruct already some signal in the pixel. Well, then we can step one more step and another step, and you see how it gradually becomes white. So now we have a maximum here, and we can now determine the, essentially the magnitude or the average magnitude of the bright fringes. Of course, we can then step ahead and you see that then the pixel gets dark again because we are moving with the period again over the bright fringes and everything disappears. So this is how we can construct essentially these kind of triangular shapes and these triangular shapes are a surrogate measurement for our wavefront. So from these triangular shapes, we can now essentially measure our phase contrast, the absorption and the dark field. One problem that we didn't talk about is that we actually also have medical grade X-ray sources and they're as large as our detector pixels, well, at least in the schematic, but they are approximately in the same ballpark and much larger than the actual fringe patterns that we want to produce. But here we can use this trick again of using essentially many slits. So we introduce this grating G0 and with the grating G0 I'm able to produce even from a medical grade X-ray source a uniform propagation pattern. Then I place my object, this distorts the wavefront in a way, then I go to my face grating that creates the fringe pattern and in the right distance I'm measuring here with my detector, I move the analyzer grating, and this allows us to actually get all the information that we need for phase contrast and dark field imaging. So if we do so, then we get essentially these triangular waves, and from those we can now measure without sample and with sample, and this allows us to reconstruct the phase here. This is how we see the phase. We can take the means of the two waves and essentially compute the fraction of the two and this gives us the attenuation. And we can compute something that is called visibility. So this is essentially the maximum and the minimum subtracted divided by the maximum plus the minimum. And this we can compute for essentially the configuration with and without object. And then we take the two and compute the fraction, and this gives us the dark field signal. So you see, we have this complicated measurement setup, but we get essentially a surrogate signal of the waves. And actually, this describes the average behavior of the waves in that pixel. And from that, we can reconstruct the desired information. So that's cool. That was all the information that we wanted to have, right? Let's spend a couple of words on dark field imaging. So the dark field imaging, which is the last value that we computed, is caused by ultra small angle scattering. And ultra small angle scattering is introduced by structures. So we can visualize essentially very small scale structures that lie way beyond the resolution of the imaging system. So we see micrometer structure effects in pixels that are 50 or 100 micrometer large. So it's an order of magnitude different, but we can still measure the effect this way. And this is cool. And what's also cool is that it's dependent on the orientation. So we can also figure out the orientation of fibers, because if I look along the fiber, there is essentially no microangle scattering. But if I look perpendicular to the fiber, I get scattering here. And this means that depending on the orientation of the fiber, I get a different scattering signal. And this then allows us to reconstruct the actual orientation of the fiber. And we think that this information may be very relevant for osteoporosis or other 
kind of applications where you're interested in the configuration of fibers. So that's pretty cool. Let's look into a couple of examples. And this is an example here by Franz Pfeiffer from TU Munich. And sorry, there's a spelling mistake here. This is an example of a frozen mouse. And here you can very clearly see a tumor, for example. Another example here is from the Erlangen Center for Astroparticle Physics. And there they did an experiment where they looked at gummy bears. So you see we have four gummy bears here. They appear to be just regular gummy bears, but actually there were a couple of modifications to them. So this guy here actually has been impaled with a toothpick. Then the third gummy bear here has also been pinned down with a regular pin. And then we have the last guy. This is the white gummy bear and the white gummy bear just looks like a regular gummy bear. So let's see what happens in the absorption image. First gummy bear is just fine. Second gummy bear seems to be fine. Third gummy bear, okay, I see the needle. So this is a metal needle, I see it. Fourth gummy bear, nothing to see. Let's look at the face contrast image. And in the face contrast image, we see this guy, just regular. There's something going on here in the face contrast image. And there's also something going on here. So in the face contrast, we see a little more. And this guy only appears very regular. Well, let's look at the dark field image. And in the dark field image, you see what's happening. So first of all, our toothpick has wooden fibers and they scatter. They have this micro angle scattering, so there's a huge signal here. The pin is also visible. Uh, the pin actually doesn't do a lot of micro angle scattering, but it causes beam hardening, and the beam hardening also causes in a certain effect that it's visible in the dark field image. And lastly, we see this guy up here. I'm not sure if you have noticed that, but Actually, the guys from ECAP, they inserted some small beads into the gummy bear and they cause scattering. So we can see now this microstructure beads and they actually produce dark field signal that you can't see in any of the other imaging modalities. So it's just not present, but we can see it in the dark field. And such small microstructures may be a game changer for the discovery of breast cancer onset because we think it's associated to micro calcifications and this could be a relevant technology to diagnose breast cancer really early. Well, what else? There's also the idea about osteoporosis. This is the absorption image. This is the dark field image and you can see that we get very high signals here and there is the belief that it might be related that the small holes in which the cells, the osteoblasts live, when they stop producing additional bone material, these holes get bigger and they may introduce the scattering here. But then again, you know, the bones are also very dense here and we are not exactly sure whether this could also be related to beam hardening. So we see some signal, but we are not entirely convinced that this is a game changer for osteoporosis. Well, what else can be done? We've seen that we can reconstruct actually fiber orientations, and this is actually a work of our lab and the experimental physics here in Erlangen together. So we were able to reconstruct the orientation of the fibers in a voxel. And you see here, this is the piece that we looked at. So this is carbon reinforced carbon fibers and they're aligned essentially in a way that you have carbon fibers on top of each other and in every layer they have a different direction. So if you image them and then look at different slices, 
then you can resolve them also here. And you see that in every slice, you have a different orientation. So this is the projection onto certain directions. So in these images, we only show scalar components. So we essentially compute the inner product of these directions with the actual voxels, and then you get images like this. This is difficult to follow. This is also why we then used the vectorial information and we started tracking particles that are essentially propagating along the vector directions. And if you do that, then you can create images like this one and they very clearly show that in different slices you have a very different orientation of the fibers. And again, the fibers are actually smaller than what we actually can reconstruct. So we can reconstruct fiber orientations on average per voxel that are below the resolution of the actual reconstruction grid. So that's pretty cool. I have one more sample here. So this is actually a wood block. It also has fibers in different orientations. And here we reconstructed them and show them. And you can very clearly see that they have different orientations in the different layers. So also a very nice result. Very well, how can this be measured? And this is the actual measurement setup in the Erlang Center for Astroparticle Physics here in Erlang, Germany. And let me point out a couple of things here. This is a medical grade X-ray tube. This is the G0. So this is where the coherent source is being generated. And then you have the phase grating. So this is the G1. You would probably place your object somewhere here and you have the detector with the phase stepping actually at this position. And now you see the long distances here, but they have to be aligned in micrometer ranges. So you have to be very careful in the alignment. And obviously, you have to spend quite a bit of time in order to have the optimal alignment done for all of these gratings. Also, this may be dependent on temperature because it's micrometers. And if you have a change in temperature, then also the gratings may shift slightly and so on. So this has to be recalibrated quite frequently. And you do that best with automated means. Very well. This brings us already to the end of this video. I highly recommend the book chapter by Johannes Bob. So he actually summarized all of this in this presentation, as well as some additional references. So please have a look at our textbook. And this already brings us to the end of this video. So you've seen now a very experimental kind of imaging modality, where we are essentially still constructing the actual imaging techniques. Still, we've seen that it may have a couple of advantages. So it would actually be great to see whether this actually translates into clinical practice or not. And you see, of course, the reason why it's not yet translated to clinical practice is that we have to provide proven evidence that it will improve the actual clinical practice. So this could not be demonstrated yet, but at the point where we can show that it really makes a difference for the treatment of the patients, I'm very sure that this kind of technology will translate very quickly into the clinic. So this is the kind of fundamental trade-off between fundamental research, developing new imaging modalities and new face contrasts and image contrasts, and the clinical need. And obviously, the technology will only translate if there is an unmet clinical need that clearly drives the benefit of the patient. Very well, this already brings us to the end of this small video. I hope you enjoyed it and I'm very much looking forward to seeing you in the next video when we talk about nuclear medicine and functional imaging. Thank you very much for watching and bye bye. <laughs>